Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. Um, I'm Chief Executive of the RSA. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here uh, this evening. Before we begin, can I ask you to make sure your mobile phone is switched to silent? Uh, we're filming tonight and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone who's watching online. And a reminder that if you're in the room or online want to join in the conversation, the hashtag for the event is RSA Faith. Uh, so please feel free to, to tweet and get the conversation going uh, on social media. Now, housekeeping notice is over. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's special event. It's exploring critical issues linking architecture, faith, and community. At a time when society is increasingly divided in all sorts of ways, we've brought together an expert panel to help us explore the potential of shared spaces and values to foster community cohesion and collaboration. It's been an event I've been looking forward to for ages, partly because two of the buildings that have had the most profound effect on me are the Hagia Sophia and the Mesquita at Cordoba, which are both buildings that have an amazing interfaith and, uh, and also conflict between faith imprinted on them in the most incredibly powerful way. So it's a fascinating topic. We're delighted to welcome uh, Chairman John McCaslin and Design Director Aidan Potter of the award-winning architectural firm John McCaslin and Partners. The practice has an emphasis on contemporary design for a changing world and has been involved in a number of faith projects. John and Aidan will speak about the evolving design, role and function of places of worship at the heart of increasingly diverse communities. I'm also pleased to introduce distinguished contributors, the Reverend of the Lord Griffiths, a superintendent minister at Wesley's Chapel, and Sophia D'Souza, chief executive of the Glasshouse Community-led Design. Uh, Leslie Griffiths will bring the insights into the role of faith communities in meeting the needs of societies, and Sophia will explore connections between design, people, and place. And when we've heard from them, if you're not completely intimidated by their brilliance and expertise, uh, I will invite your comments and questions. So I think we're going to have a fascinating hour, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming John McCaslin. Okay, Robert, dear Robert, you can do the slides, can you? Okay, can, um, can we go forward? No, no, go to the first one, please. First slide. The cover. No, nope, back. No, nope, one more. Back. There you go. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. I can only do one thing at a time, that's why Robert is kindly offered to do the slides. Right, good evening. Um, so I've got 12,000 years of religious architecture in 12 minutes. So um, <clears throat> at 12 minutes, Matthew, presumably you can put your hand up and say, or speed up or stop. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start off. Over the years, um, our practice has responded to a diverse, diverse set of challenges facing communities all over the world. In Kigali, Rwanda, at the genocide memorial site, in Kenya with the rebuilding of a community cathedral west of Nairobi and in Port of Prince, Haiti, following the devastating earthquake in 2012, uh, 2010 by rebuilding the city's historic market hall and gathering place. These projects illustrate our commitment to working with communities with the chosen faith and way of life, which my colleague Aidan Potter will discuss shortly. So what do we mean by the architecture of faith? And what is it that churches, temples, mosques, synagogues, and other places of worship offer us in the fast-paced, ever-changing, and complex world that we live in? My introduction this evening will touch on these issues and highlight examples of how the design of places of worship have evolved over time to serve a broad spectrum of communities. It's difficult to overstate the significance of faith architecture for it dates back thousands of years, as illustrated from a 12,000-year-old religious site here in Anatolia. And today serves in descending order some 2.2 billion Christians, 1.6 billion followers of Islam, a billion Hindus, and 500 million Buddhists, roughly three quarters of the world's people. Less populated religions include, of course, Judaism, whose 16 million followers are spread across 120 countries from 6 million in Israel to 36 in Bahrain. Next. And the synagogue here in Cochin, the oldest in the Commonwealth, which has a congregation of 26. Historically, uh, next, uh, 
Thank you. Historically, faith architecture defined communities. For centuries in England, for example, it was a dominating presence in people's lives, thoughts, and behaviors. In the Hindu faith, worship, meditation, and family-based rites of passage have been central to daily life for over two and a half thousand years. And in the Islamic world, domestic and faith architecture share the same courtyard built forms that date back to the seventh century. Today, in the increasingly secular and virtualized age, it seems significant to me that most people, even non-believers, continue to respect and value places of worship. So why is this? Well, surely, it's because not only do these spiritual places offer solace and emotional connections, but they are always, always the most permanent, symbolic, and expressive of buildings. Next. Of course, I can see it here. I don't have to look back. Suleimani Mosque, uh, the Be uh, Byzantine and Islamic blend uh, designed by the great uh, um, Ottoman architect Sinan. Next. Two millennia ago, places of worship were the absolute nu nuclei of their communities. Today, in much of the developed world, the reverse seems to be the case, with public culture dictating the terms of the relationship between places of worship and the societies that they serve. The cultural shift, or this cultural shift, has, been, has seen a remarkable evolution in terms of faith architecture. Next. And here are three examples from the post-war period which demonstrate that modernist architecture, even brutalist architecture, can serve the needs of the architecture of faith. On the left is Erosaranen's glorious non-denominational chapel at MIT in Cambridge, Mass. In the middle, the multi-faith Air Force Cadet ch Chapel in Colorado Springs by Skidmore Owings of Merrill, and on the right, the powerful aesthetic of St. Bride's Roman Catholic Church in East Kilbride by the Scottish architects Gillespie, Kidd, and Coyer. Aidan, could you just get me a bit of water? I wouldn't mind, thanks. Next. By contrast, the recent... By contrast, the recent evangelical megachurch at Saddleback in California on the left and the Watermark Community Church in Dallas on the right are more conference hall aesthetic than places to pray. Next. Whilst the architecture of the vast Sheikh Zayed Mosque in Abu Dhabi incorporates traditional Islamic symbols from many sources in its campus of faith. Next. It's important to remember, though, that these grandiose, grandiose schemes that we've just seen don't necessarily reflect the typical contemporary faith condition. For instance, next, here is the beautiful uh, Bruder Klaus Chapel in rural Germany, designed by the Swiss architect Peter Zumther in 2007 and hand-built by local farmers. If you can look this up, it's an amazing story of the construction of, of this church, which is worth looking at. Next. And on the Thai-Burmese border, the Kuma Watanabe's recent multi-faith uh, project unites a Buddhist prayer space with an educational and community hub for its refugee congregation. Next. And in terms of multifunctional and multi-faith buildings for which I have a particular passion, this is our teaching building in rural Malawi, init initially programmed as an infant school uh, this modest brick and timber structure is also used for adult learning, as a community health space, and as a non-denominational place for prayer. Next. And a building I know well, perched on the east side of the A11 Autostrada, just north of Florence and next to petrol stations and motels, is the extraordinary San Giovanni Battista Church, designed by Giovanni Michelucci built in the early 1960s to honor the workers who died building the autostrada itself. This majestic concrete, stone, and copper roof structure continues to have a very particular resonance for its community and those who drive by. Sometimes, a private and personal vision inspires a place of worship, drawing a much wider, not necessarily religious, community to its midst. Next. For instance, in Arkansas, Faye Jones' exquisite Thorncrown Chapel from 1980 
was commissioned by a retired teacher and built on a forested hillside. Its wonderful filigree timber interior welcomes some 2,000 visitors a day. And I think a particular favourite of Aidan and mine. Next. Whilst on an even more intimate scale is the Irish architect Neil McLaughlin's elliptical and very beautiful Bishop Edward King Chapel near Oxford, flooded with gorgeous light. Next. And in Copenhagen, one significantly scaled Lutheran church embodies the idea of faith and community as a single design tableau. For here, the Gothic plan and the expressionist brickwork of Grunvig Church, designed by Peter Jensen Klint in 1927, was built using six million bricks, which were also used to construct the community around it. Next. And how many small towns, I wonder, would be bold enough to commission such a radical design as Godfrey Baum's brutalist pilgrimage church near Dusseldorf? Completed in 1968, this structure is considered to be the Pritzker Prize winner's greatest work, challenging in its architecture and its reflection of faith. Next. The relationship between faith and those who have built their places of worship is ever-changing. In the Middle Ages, sizable workforces of cathedral building, building joiners and stonemasons became embedded in communities over long periods of time. Next. The magnificent Ely Cathedral, illustrated here, has Romanesque segments, a porch in the Gothic style, and a 14th century octagonal tower, which means the cathedral was in a permanent state of construction for hundreds of years, a physical reminder of the endurance of a community's faith. Next. And in Barcelona, Antonio Gaudi's Sagrada Familia is an ongoing example of this type of evolving commitment to a place of worship. Begun in 1882 and pausing only briefly following Gaudi's untimely death in 1926, its construction is expected to be complete in 2026, some 144 years after its groundbreaking. The architecture is symbolic of both Catholic worship and the independent spirit of Barcelona and Catalonian communities. And as an aside, yesterday, a good friend of ours, Irvine Seller, passed away. He was a wonderful developer, um, built the Shard. And it's interesting to know the Shard. If you look at the height of the Shard, uh, when fully built, the Sagrada Familia will be about four-fifths of the height of the Shard. So the scale will be extraordinary. I knew that Irvine, some way, had to fit into this. Um, next. A significant role for faith architecture is to serve communities who have suffered natural disasters or those who are impoverished or marginalized, providing places for both physical security as well as religious sanctuary. In 1986, for example, an avalanche spread through the village of Monu in Switzerland. Part of the response to the destruction was the building a decade later of this church, designed by the Swiss master architect Mario Botta, a bold architectural statement of its community's endurance. Next. In New Zealand, Shugura Ban's so-called cardboard cathedral on the left embodies a temporary work worship space following the city's 2011 earthquake. Whilst the same year on the right, our proposed temporary place of worship was set within the ruins of the Cathedral of Our Lady of Assumption in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Next. And in Ulm, Germany, the architects KSG placed the city's new synagogue a stone's throw from its former location destroyed during Kristallnacht, with this new synagogue reclaiming its former central location. Next. And finally, in London, our project to rebuild the modern mosque is rooted in the ambitions and leadership of this community, which suffered the destruction of its, mo of its beloved mosque gutted by fire in 2015. Within one week of the fire, its determined congregation was holding services within its remaining elements, which, when rebuilt, will return as Western Europe's largest Islamic place of worship. Next. The architect's role in the architecture of faith is a complex one, creating spaces that offer a safe haven to emotion, to memory, and to religious connections between places and peoples, no matter what their circumstances, commanding empathy and practicality in equal measure. I'll leave you with a final thought. 
Or will worshippers continue to depend on faith architecture as their physical place of worship? More and more people of all faiths in all parts of the world are leading lives that are increasingly personalized and screen-based. Snapchat, although I have to say not me, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Google. There are already websites called thevirtualchurch.com and airjesus.com. The Diocese of Oxford has started something called the iChurch. In 10 or 20 years' time, how many people will be worshipping on screen in the digitally imaged place of their choice? York Minster, Mecca, Anger Wat, or the Urver Synagogue? Or is there something about the architectures of faith and the actual rather than the virtual gathering of worshippers that cannot be eroded? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I have a slightly less ambitious uh, ambit. Uh, I probably only deal with five years of uh, a series of projects that the practice has been involved in. And I suppose uh, the point I'll try and make is that each of these projects are very different, very distinct, both nationally and internationally. All of them, I think, evidence the continuing re relevance of architecture of faith but perhaps all of them show that uh, perhaps the architectural model needs to change a little bit more rapidly to accommodate uh, a rapidly changing environment, as John has alluded to, in terms of people's aspirations and needs for faith. The first illustration is our cathedral in Caricio. And as a Catholic and as an architect, uh, very properly the opportunity to be involved in the participate in the delivery of a cathedral is, is absolutely a highlight to one's career. But actually, a cathedral is the work of many hands. And uh, as our client uh, often told me, it is the work of an invisible hand. And uh, that's undoubtedly an important dynamic as an architect uh, in the engagement of faith architecture, that uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a concern and interest in uh, an inspiration that in some regards is beyond yourself. Um, the cathedral. Um, Whilst it is a Roman Catholic cathedral, Kenya is a country of seven and a half million Catholics, a third of the population. The cathedral seats 1,200 people, 1,500 people at a push. And every Sunday, this cathedral uh, runs three services, which are completely full. So uh, comparisons with the, the practice of Catholicism that I'm aware of, and I know in this country, whilst interesting, uh, pale into insignificance in terms of the intensity and the simplicity of the faith in Africa. So it is dangerous, well not dangerous, but it is um, not sometimes helpful to make allusions between the practice of a similar faith in different contexts. The context changes the faith and the practice of faith in profound terms. Interestingly, at the same time, exactly the same time, the practice was also delivering and developing proposals for the mosque in Doha, in the, uh, the Mushareb in Doha. And uh, again, uh, an ambitious project right at the heart of probably one of the world's largest and most ambitious urban quarters. And I suppose what's particularly interesting about the mosque, uh, not just as a piece of architecture, was the determination to actually signify and place a building, a significant building of religious assembly at the very heart of urban development. And I think actually that is something that we're in danger of losing as we... Uh, increasingly develop our cities and actually lose a contact with the placement and sanctity of churches and mosques and places of worship as significant moments in our cities. At a slightly more modest scale, but nonetheless a fascinating and important project uh, dealing with uh, the rediscovery and uh, the reuse, adaptive reuse of an important, a very important uh, chapel, John Wesley's Chapel on the City Road and the uh, extension of the, the Museum of Methodism uh, within the chapel. And in this country, of course, uh, a lot of faith architecture very properly is concerned with the sensitive and adaptive reuse of historic buildings, which is very much uh, the context that we find ourselves in. And in that exact same context, and at the same time, uh, a remarkable project to actually look at the adaptation of the great room in the Friends Meeting House in the, uh, the centre of the Quakers, a building you all probably know opposite Euston Station. 
And here, a project that was concerned to extend and exploit and introduce flexibility into the use of the major space. And I think the opportunities to actually extend the use of historic places of worship and offer more flexible use for those to extend their use is also a recurrent theme of our work, definitely, in this country. And um, sadly, in a sunny sort of way, the last project of this suite was uh, our adaptation of a deconsecrated church and uh, finding sustainable futures for an extraordinary range of uh, churches which have fallen into disuse. Being properly respectful of these churches, this is the church St. James's at Hatcham, uh, its conversion to educational use for the uh, Goldsmiths College, again, I think is an important dynamic and obligation we all have to the legacy of these important buildings in terms of national identity. Now, architecture is a moral activity. Uh, John and I were certainly educated by a, a generation of architects after the war who absolutely believed that architecture was uh, a social art. And indeed, I think, uh, as many architects do, we often talk about our buildings in moral terms. We talk about uh, honesty of materials and the integrity of the building itself. Pugin was the origin of this idea. He introduced uh, the moral imperative. And of course, his grand vision of a new Jerusalem uh, where the, the modern industrial city would be properly balanced with a, a responsible adaptation and development of religious architecture is in a way a kind of a sad vision because I suppose that particular vision uh, in, 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 in specific terms was never realized. And, uh, but nonetheless... Uh, the placement of ecclesiastical architecture at the very heart and center of all the cities that we live in uh, historically is a context that we all completely understand. I think perhaps one of the interesting issues that we may talk about later is the fact that the logical placement and identity of places of worship and the integration of places of work at worship into our cities is, uh, is something we're losing in terms of uh, a disconnection with uh, faith and community in literal terms, in terms of its registration into our developing cities. Uh, we certainly do need to look at uh, the exploitation and extension of existing and new buildings of faith to actually exploit and uh, look at all sorts of creative opportunities to introduce new uses, multiple new uses, into existing buildings to create sustainable futures, uh, sus real sustainable futures for you know, uh, a collection of buildings which are in many regards at peril in this country. It's a significant and important issue that all architects and faith institutions have to address. Um, in some regards, uh, in many regards, and certainly in my faith, it is uh, quite difficult to find the balance between uh, the development of a, a modern church that is properly respectful to the, uh, the format and the historic legacy and the procedures and routines of a faith and also updating it to adapt it to new uses. This slide shows the, the adaptation of the plan of our cathedral at, at Caricho. And you can see that uh, we moved away from the, the Latin cross and it really was a response to uh, the bishop's, uh, uh, Bishop Emmanuel's desire to actually extend and improve the interface of the congregation with the act of communion and to change the format but also retain a legible connection with 2,000 years of history. So finding a balance between making some changes but also respecting the legacy of 2,000, often more, years of continuity of worship is a, is a particular issue that we faced a number of times. As John mentioned, uh, we are very much in a, a remarkable time. Uh, it's often been termed as a, a 21st century reformation, uh, an extraordinary change in uh, the practice of faith, uh, in the denomination, the, the, uh, the, 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 the plurality of faith, particularly in this country. And also, uh, very interesting new models in which, uh, I don't know if any of you have actually been to the Hillsong uh, sermons at the Dominion Theatre, but again, an extraordinary event in which uh, an evangelical group practices uh, faith 
uh, to a huge audience uh, in a completely different format, in a very unusual format, and, and who's to say that isn't relevant and important? And finding new models and adapting new models to the new ways and expectations that generations have for faith is a particular challenge that we do all faith. We all change. I will leave you with a moral paradox. It's a paradox that I feel very strongly uh, as a Catholic. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, these marvellous buildings that we've had the pleasure and significance of developing, uh, often internationally and nationally, are expensive buildings. Uh, just the surface area, the size, and although faith isn't about expense, uh, undoubtedly, the expenditure uh, of uh, a relatively dwindling resource in creating buildings to the glory and honor of the Lord is, is, is an interesting challenge. Um, but there are other models. There are other interesting models for a church. And again, this is a church. This is uh, a, a church established in Tottenham, on an industrial estate in Tottenham, uh, the High Road to Holiness. And this is a church that offers refuge and succor to homeless people. And uh, the only thing that shows you it's a church is that little piece of plastic on the wall. But actually, within this small series of rooms, there is refuge, warmth, support, and comfort for homeless people in Tottenham. It's a very, very real and uh, totally important uh, obligation that that particular church actually manages to administer. So um, my last slide uh, is a comment, I suppose, about the fact that uh, whatever future uh, faith architecture has in the community, I think it must be centred on and properly attentive to the real concerns of those who are less privileged than uh, all of us in terms of offering possible futures. And I think if the dear Lord was with us today, and I'm sure he is with us in every regard, I think he'd be less concerned about the buildings in his name and more concerned about the poor people on the steps. Thank you very much. Leslie, over to you. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to this august gathering and uh, particularly to bounce any ideas I have off the splendid presentations that we've just had that have looked at uh, the physical space uh, that architects can design and cater for for worshipping communities. I will be looking, of course, at the communities rather than the envelopes which encase their practices and their comings together. Um, and uh, perhaps that's the right place to start. Uh, what a wonderful array of modern responses to the prevailing, against the evidence sometimes, need for a faith dimension in social life, not just in developing countries, but here too. It's a stubborn uh, manifestation that refuses to go away. And of course, across the ages, um, architects have responded in uh, with materials and with ideas that were appropriate to the age in which they gave expression to those ideas. The challenge for architects, people who deal with a physical environment, um, is, uh, well, it's manifold. First of all, if you look at Coventry Cathedral and the interplay between Basil Spence and the cathedral chapter, you have the dialectic that matters most. Um, the client is always going to pay the bills and will have a significant voice. The architect will have an idea that he desperately would love to prevail um, and sometimes compromises are necessary which are either satisfactory or definitely not satisfactory. The danger is always that the physical space will contribute uh, an envelope, an enclosed space within which faith is to be practiced and in some way imprison an idea that's yearning for fresh air. Uh, certainly in times of uh, religious retreat, as we are in experiencing here just at the minute, uh, that's a very real danger, that uh, somewhere to retreat to, a redoubt of high walls um, must be resisted. Of course, that's not just down to the architect, it's down to the leadership of the community itself. Um, but that's one danger, um, an embattled community will look to its home as its castle and draw up the drawbridge when it's inside, sing some nice hymns to get a 
good feel uh, about things, and then go out and face the nasty world, uh, cheered up by what's happened inside. The other danger, it seems to me, is the roof. The space has to be covered, of course, especially in inclement climates like this. Um, but you have to get the balance between safe space for people to say their prayers, to sing their hymns, uh, to seek inspiration, to encourage each other. That's what it's all about, really. Um, in a space that is definable. Um, at the same time, creating the impression that there is no roof, because all that happens, if it's real, is subspecie aeternitatis. Uh, it's true to something that is seen by the eye of God himself. Now, in the days when you could count on Gothic to provide perpendicularity, you got the sense of the upward soaring of the spirit in that kind of space. Now that that's no longer what happens on the whole, uh, you have to achieve that, or aim to achieve that, even though your ceilings are a little bit lower, your thresholds should be a bit bigger. So you have a challenge as architects. I'm not an architect. I'm delighted I'm not an architect. I, uh, <laughs> I, but, but let me just tell you from the, from the world of, of theology how uh, we theologians have over the centuries, with our words and our philosophizing and our formulaic responses to faith, built equally formidable uh, constructions within which faith has had a good chance to die. Um, that uh, actually faith, if it's real, needs fresh air. And buildings should create, create a sense of uh, air that can be breathed, and relationships that can be developed, and freedoms that can be enjoyed, and security that can be experienced, all of that within a space that is still within four walls, uh, as well as the upward thing, of course. Now, what I've chosen to do, because clearly I'd uh, like to be the typical Methodist minister who has accomplished uh, the art of speaking in Fidel Castro length utterances, um, I must try and do it in seven minutes, is suggest that perhaps the eye might be off the ball if we stuck to the idea of the built environment. Because that isn't, on the whole, where interesting and lively forms of religious practice are being experienced. What do I mean by that? Well, pilgrimages are popular very popular just at the moment. Not just Compostela and Walsingham and all kinds of places, even at Wesley's Chapel. We just walk from St. Paul's Cathedral to the chapel every 24th of May, our patronal festival, and solvitur ambulando. Uh, all kinds of things get settled in the mind whilst you're on the march. Um, that sitting there week after week doesn't always do it. And uh, just uh, getting uh, the rain on you and uh, braving the elements and uh, daring to show your faith in public is a real extra ingredient. High octane Christianity. Kids love pilgrimages. They'll go um, on gap years with their backpacks and so on and attempt great pilgrimages, the walks that have been traditionally done over the centuries. Uh, I remember I had a good friendship with uh, Cardinal Hume whilst he was alive, and I remember him telling me how every year he would go with 12 busfuls of students from London University to Lourdes. And the excitement of the young people was palpable. And the experience was magnificent. And the fellowship was brilliant. And as soon as they got off the bus in London again, he knew that those kids would not go to church again for another year. And somehow, um, we must uh, subscribe to the idea that we're living in an age that, whilst it continues to believe stubbornly, persistently, contraindicatively, um, it does not want to believe in a sense that demands that it belongs. Believing, not necessarily belonging. Which leads me to think that we need fewer churches with better liturgies and better opportunities and facilities rather than just perpetuating all kinds of things. Now, the other area where this kind of thing is on, on display is retreats. 
people love going to a monastery for a few days of silence. St. Binos in North Wales, um, or the, uh, the great thing that was on television down in the south of England. Um, all these places command an attention, a one-off, um, a break from the routine, um, meeting people you haven't met before. Um, all of that is a challenge, some of it intimidating, but there's a great popularity for it. There's a national retreat movement that uh, puts together in a catalogue fashion all the places that have great history, wonderful architecture, are in secluded and beautiful places, and they are very attractive, especially since they've added ensuite rooms. <laughs> And then how do you explain this extraordinary phenomenon I picked up from the Church Times just another, the other week? Architects bid to design monument to prayer. Under the aegis of the Royal Institute of uh, British Architects, um, a competition's been set up. Uh, somebody's put up the money, a million bricks to build a monument to answered prayer taking inspiration from the Angel of the North, wanting alongside a motorway to put up some phenomenal thing with a, with a little chapel and a, a visitor center that will remind people that prayer is, in people's experience, answered and people feel blessed. And this will be a monument to that. And five have been shortlisted, uh, three from Britain, uh, one from Denmark and one from Italy, with rather intriguing designs, I have to say. Um, and so um, a bona fide, kosher, under the aegis of all those who know about architecture, that's the RIBA, we know that only they know about architecture, um, it, is a, it is a competition underway and we wait to see the results of that. But once again, monuments, significant places, inspirational um, um, uh, monuments uh, to attract the attention and to inspire. Um, and then how on earth would you explain the phenomenon of Thézé in France, in Burgundy. I used to go there quite a lot and teach the members of the monastic community there English literature. They were particularly fond of uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, um, who of course himself was a Jesuit and associated with St. Binos, the now a retreat centre. Um, but uh, translating Hopkins into French is virtually impossible. And uh, actually, Thézé is virtually impossible. But a Swiss pastor after the Second World War, um, horrified at the, at the happenings of the Second World War, built his little establishment just across the border between Germany and France in order that people from Germany and France should find refuge in the same place. Uh, Brother Roger Schutz, whom I knew quite well until he was assassinated not too long ago, um, was insistent that he would not have a fine building he deliberately got himself organized within sight of Cluny, the biggest monastery of the Middle Ages and the mother monastery for uh, an imperializing network of monasteries across Europe. Never again would he want to go down that road with its triumphalism and its power lust. So he built this thing, they worship in a hangar. Well, even that's a grand title for it. It's prevailing quality is darkness. Because the one thing you don't want to do when you go inside is see anything. Especially if Catholics and Protestants are there. When you go for communion, you don't know which line you're in. <laughs> and uh, Pope John XXIII called it a little springtime for the church. And so you have hundreds of thousands of young people in their 20s and 30s gathering there every single summer. How do you uh, explain that? Um, other than on the basis of a fine and lovely grand place for people to meet in. It's the opposite of that. And so we're trying to grasp something by its tail. For me, the finest and the simplest ideas in life. I mean, I've just come back from India, in Kerala. I was at the top of a mountain. Everything was just phenomenally beautiful. And what I wanted to do was bottle it and bring it back with me and uh, I knew that once it was bottled it was dead when I was a lepidopterist as a child I loved the butterflies but when they were on display in my cabinet they were no longer alive the challenge is 
to create a space within which things can live and breathe and flourish. That's it. Last but by no means least, Sophia. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk this evening about the lived experience of places of worship. We've talked about how they're created. We've talked about um, how we interact um, with faith. But this evening, I'd like to explore what happens when people are inhabiting these spaces, when they have to look after these spaces, and when they need to adapt them to, uh, to new needs. The landscape of religious buildings is incredibly complex, and our relationship with them as well. Uh, whether we step into a faith building which is from our faith practice or another's, we cross a threshold and we step into a different space. Different uh, religious beliefs bring with them different types of buildings and different liturgy of space, different sacredness of space. But what they all share is that they have spaces that have been created to bring a community together to practice their faith together. But just as each of us belongs to a number of different communities, where we live, where we work, our children's school community, our faith community, our communities of shared interests. So do places of worship have a number of different communities around them. And, and what I'd like to look at is that relationship between the community of faith attached to a religious building and to the local community around them. It's a time at the moment where community spaces are under threat. Um, there's less funding available, community centers are being closed down. And these places of worship that have sat for centuries um, as the center of community life suddenly have both a new opportunity and a new challenge. How do they open their doors to those not just to practice a faith there, but to become community hubs as they were originally conceived? How do they, they become spaces that can be shared by people of different faith groups or people who don't practice faith at all, but who need a space in which to gather and come together with their community? Um, I'd like to look specifically at a couple of projects that we've worked with um, through a, a project we're involved in called Empowering Design Practices. And it's just a couple of examples that, that show the different approach, uh, the ways in, if you like, to rethinking um, how a space can work. And in particular, I'd like to look at the power of design to transform these spaces, but not design um, only in the hands of architects, but also in the hands of people rethinking and reimagining their spaces and working with architects to do that. Uh, this is a church in, in Oxfordshire. It's quite a small church, um, and it sat there for approximately, in some shape or form, for approximately 900 years. Um, it's in a village that um, recently decided they needed a new village hall, and as part of the millennium funding streams, there was an opportunity to conceive a new building and to get it built, but it never really happened. And the community came together and said, well, do we really need a new community, a new community building? Isn't there a building here that we could repurpose or use or share? And they got together with the church, the parish council and the church and local community members, and they thought, well, let's turn this lovely church into both our church and our village hall. And one of my favorite anecdotes about this place is that half the village refer to it as the church and half of the village refer to it as the, as the, um, the village hall. But to make that possible, they had to make some changes. Um, it was a building that had no services, no running water, uh, no toilets, no kitchen, and frankly was a bit cold and damp and not suitable for many spaces so they came together and they made a few a few changes and they did those really taking into account the importance of good design um, you can see here one of the uh, things that they did was remove the pews to create a flexible space um, many of you will know that pews come with a lot of baggage in terms of how people feel about them whether they should stay or leave but um, one of the great things about this particular church is that they, they made the decision to remove the pews. They made them available to people in the community if they wanted them. Um, but they created a space that was flexible. And you can see um, that they 
brought design features very carefully into these changes, you'll notice that on the, uh, the tiling work around the font is actually from the flooring that was taken out. Um, they took, they built a beautiful little passage through to an extension for the toilets, very sensitively built, but also bringing in local craftsmen to do the work. And this is what happens there now. There are parties, children's groups, pilates, um, lunch clubs, workshops. They even have a cinema club there. You can see in that picture over there, they have a screen that, that comes down. And they have a, cine club, a cinema club there. And all of this was done by local people coming together and saying, well, you know, what can this building be to us? And how can we use it and make it multifunctional but protect um, the faith practice that happens there. And I had a wonderful conversation with a vicar who, and just coming back to uh, this font, moving the font from uh, its previous position means two things. One, that when the bride celebrating her wedding steps through the door with her father or whoever it might be accompanying her, they don't need to separate to go around the font or do this to go around the font. Um, they simply walk down the aisle. But also, in, in serious terms around the quality of faith practices that can happen there, the vicar said to me, well, actually, moving the font and removing the pews has allowed me to do different types of services. I can do a christening there in a much more intimate setting around the font. It's a small part of the church that can create a very intimate environment, and it gives me the flexibility to work with a large group a large celebration, or indeed a very small one. Now, a completely different take on the religious building, if you like, or a building where faith practices happen, is the Vestry Hall in Sheffield, which is inhabited by the Israq Somali Community Association. Uh, this is a group that has been practicing their community activity and their faith services for some 30 years in the community. Um, they were tenants of this building that was owned by the local authority. Former Vestry Hall, it's a grade two listed building from 1857. The local authority wanted to get rid of it, really. They were a bit tired of looking after it. It was a, a bit of a problematic building. And the community association, Israq, said, well, we'll take it on. Um, and we want to keep it in the heart of the community. We want to keep it available um, for our faith practices, but also all of our community activities. We want to keep it as a safe haven for our Muslim community here in Sheffield. We want it to be that safe space for our Somali community, but we also want it to be a place where people can come and, and meet with our communities, our Somali culture and our Muslim faith in a safe space that feels open to everybody. Now, there is a bit of a challenge. It's a building that needs some work. Um, and we've been working with them to use design to help them think about, well, what is the potential of this building? How can you make it a building that works for you and your community? And we brought them on a design training course that we do and had them actually build a model of their building, which at first they gasped at and said, oh, we couldn't possibly do that. It's too hard. But actually, in building this model and in really exploring the spaces, they started to understand its potential. And I think the great thing about design is it unlocks potential. Good design unlocks potential and does it well. Here's them building it. And then they used this model, they developed it further with a group of students from Sheffield University to start to talk to local people about the building. They're at the beginning of their journey, but they are using a process of design and a process of rethinking and reimagining this building that they're taking over um, as a way of connecting and reaching out with a community, of inviting different communities into theirs, but also of, of mixing and mingling and connecting. And I think this is a really interesting time for the potential of faith buildings to do just that, to create spaces for people to connect and come together in different ways. I end on just one of my favorite anecdotes of uh, the places that we've been working with. Um, this is the Sheffield Buddhist Center. 
um, it's a former Roman Catholic church and a, uh, a group took it on. The, the, the local um, Triratna Buddhist community in Sheffield needed a space and they took on this building. And one of the real um, moments of tension in the community was over the Buddha in the belfry which one day I will write a short story with that title. I think it's just such a lovely collection of words together. Um, but it actually makes a really important point about our connection with religious buildings, even if they're not our own. People of the local community were pleased that this building was being used again. It had sat empty. But the notion of a Buddha being placed in a Catholic belfry and the iconography of it, what it represented, was a little frightening to people. And particularly frightening was when people didn't know what it would look like. They imagined um, very brightly colored, enormous statues of the Buddha going up in the belfry. And actually, when they had a conversation about it, they realized, oh, it's actually a rather discreet and rather beautiful sculpture that sits quite beautifully in the belfry. But the conversation hadn't happened at the right time. So there's something about respecting both people's preconceptions and ideas about how they react and interact with faith buildings, but also simply having conversations about what we share, what we don't share, but how they can come together. Thank you. So I completely failed to keep the panel to time. Um, but I just thought they were also kind of interesting that it was worth it. So what we're going to do, because I am committed to letting you get out of here on time and don't want the audience to kind of dwindle away, is what we'll do is we'll take kind of five or six minutes of just points, questions from the floor, try and take as many people as we can be, as quick as you can, and then I'll invite the panel to come back and make one point. Choose one of these points to respond to that you're going to hear. You might not go see any questions at all. But, um, so let's do that. It'll be quick fire but at least there'll be some interactivity after what has been some fantastic presentations. Or are you all too stunned? Oh, yes, there's a gentleman there. Wait for the microphone to come to you. Tell us your name and make your brilliant short point. Um, Julian Bowery, uh, thank you very much for inspiring me with the beautiful designs of modern churches. I go to a Gothic cathedral, and it's great to be reminded that actually there are different ways to worship than in English Gothic cathedrals, but equally in that cathedral, St. Albans Cathedral, then I do very much feel when participating in services both very close to God by being in that space, but it's also lovely to be, see the space being used for the St. Albans fashion show, music concerts, a whole range of other things as well. Thank you. Uh, there's, oh, there's a cluster of three hands down here, down the, kind of down the aisle, as it were. There we are. Thank you. I'm James Walters. I'm chaplain at the LSE and director of our new multi-faith centre there. And um, we heard uh, primarily about buildings for particular faith communities, but increasingly we're seeing in airports and other public buildings the required uh, requirements for shared space. And I wonder um, how architecture can uh, help facilitate that interfaith interaction. Thank you. And then back down there. My name is Kim Wilkie. And you haven't actually spoken about the spaces around places of worship, particularly cemeteries. And given the pressure on burial space and how many faiths are combined in cemeteries and the opportunity for celebration and contemplation in those, it would be interesting to hear what you think. Well, I do hope one of you aren't chooses that question to answer. It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> yep, and then there's two more hands here. Hi, my name is Noura Saiz, and I'm wondering, um, the examples you showed were all contemporary interpretations of ancient religions, and I'm wondering about um, world most recent religions and how their architectural examples come into play. An example that comes to mind is the Baha'i faith, where they reinterpret the relationship between worship and service and have their own architectural elements as well. And also, of course, there are new non-religious like Sunday Assembly, for example, which are bringing people together for kind of non-religious uh, uh, collective acts, which is really interesting. Um, yes, uh, there. Uh, 
Um, I'm Caroline Newman on behalf of the Lettering Arts Trust. And um, I'm just picking up on the point about cemeteries and other spaces, but would love a comment from you on the use of craftsmanship in maintaining our contemporary architecture and bringing the older crafts into play into the modern environment. Great, that sounds like another event rather than, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll think about that. And then here, and then there, and then that's it. The, the nine, nine questions. Nine questions. You can pick two. Gillian <laughs> uh, Ashmore from the Quaker community. Um, I wondered about the relationship between the architect and decision takers in the different religions. Um, has that proved a difficulty and um, does it stand in the way of new ideas coming to the fore? Very good. And then there was another one here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the idea Tell of... Tell us who you are. Um, I'm Jennifer Sturrock. I'm a fashion designer. I'm um, wondering about the idea of beauty and that essence of a transcending um, vehicle and how important you think or don't think that is in spaces that are for faith. Good. So like on, we'd like that answer on a very important to not important, not to ten scale. So just going to say six. Beauty's important. Six or three or... No, no, I'm just being... I'm being... <laughs> I'm being flippant, of course. Um, right, okay, that was a brilliant set of questions, and uh, the panel have got two minutes each to respond to uh, them. Um, perhaps we'll kind of go, well, you've just spoken, uh, so actually we'll start with Lizzie. Lizzie, do you want to pick a couple of those questions? Uh, yeah, um, cemeteries. Uh, we have at our place a small cemeteries, two-thirds of an acre, our total site, including the building that sits on it, and we have 5,472 people buried there. We have our own catacombs. We have a complete burial register. We're available for genealogical research. Uh, people come and sit out there and have their lunch. A uh, great venue for local office workers. I agree entirely with the idea that the cemetery is a great place for meditation about the shortness of our lives and what the hell are we going to do with them. Um, and then, uh, secondly, um, uh, the decision takers. Well, of course, I'm in the House of Lords where there aren't any. Um, <coughs> um, uh, having sat until 11 o'clock last night uh, in, through discussions about Brexit and uh, being pressed in tomorrow. It's a bumper day tomorrow. Um, and um, and uh, two years, uh, we're told, of no decisions being taken, very little information being fed to us. Um, decisions uh, offered to us on a plate at the end of the day. Um, so I invite them all to come to church where we equip them to make decisions and to think about ultimate realities and the well-being of the whole of humankind. So I want to do a huge population uh, transposition from the hallowed halls of Sir Charles Barry's House of Lords to George Dance the Younger's space on the city road where I work most of my time. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to come in as well on the notion of cemetery um, because we worked, we visited a beautiful church up near Durham, St. Michael and All Angels, um, where they recognized that the cemetery and the landscape around their church and cemetery was a beautiful, calm, reflective space. And they have created uh, a whole program called Breathing Space, which is all about stepping into that space for mindfulness, for reflection but that it's open to absolutely everyone. They have a wonderful sign there saying, open to everyone, even dog walkers, which I love. The other thing I touch on very quickly is the notion of beauty. And I would add to beauty delight. And I would say, in architecture, it's an essential ingredient anywhere. If we don't have beauty, if we don't have delight. Beauty is, in a sense, personal in many ways. Delight is instinctive. And natural, and if a place delights us, then it's doing its job. Can I ask about awe? Um, where do you stand on awe? Where do I stand on awe? I think awe has its place for some people, but that it's not as necessary in my mind as delight. Very good. Delight versus awe, that'll be a future RSA yes. event. Well, I, think we'll, uh, <laughs> hey. um, I think an interesting <coughs> challenge that we have is that. Many, many faiths take place behind closed doors. And in some regards, we're a little fearful of what happens behind these closed doors. And what intrigues me about the observation about exteriorizing faith and exploiting spaces around places of worship is that it breaks down these barriers. And I, I, I'm fascinated by opportunities 
for different faiths to, um, I suppose, really celebrate all their different activities a little bit more openly by stepping outside the front door. I mean, as an architect, just to answer the second question about beauty, uh, well, in this particular context, yes, you, you do search, hopefully, for beauty. Uh, but in, 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 in the types of transformative spaces which you hope people are inspired, I think there's a, there, there are qualities of stillness and repose and a, a kind of a mute quality, which I think is more, in some regards, hopefully they're beautiful, but actually that's, that's the harder thing. And I think stillness in this frenetic world in which we live with so much information, that, that, that feeling that most sacred spaces offer, which is just a, a moment to stop the world and just dwell for a while, that's to me a slightly more significant and elusive quality to find in sacred spaces. I'm really sorry about this because I know we're running out of time, and, but I'm abusing my position as chair. Can, can you or maybe John answer the question, how is this conversation affected by the emergence of kind of secular uh, um, cathedrals, as it were, the, the, you know, whether it's monstrous buildings in the city of London or huge <coughs> football stadia or whatever, the scale of non-religious architecture. I mean, of course, if you go back historically, all the big, amazing buildings were religious buildings, and now they're standing side by side with these others. What, I, I, what? Think, I think Lewis Mumford, the great architectural critic, he said that uh, for 2,000 years, architecture was the design of one room. You know, archi architecture was uh, a concern to you know, signify uh, all those kind of uh, faith issues that uh, are at the heart of most great religions. But uh, this, I suppose the investment has, has been dislodged in our cities by a concern to create other temples of, of worship. I, I, it's inevitable. I mean, and I'm not saying that uh, that's a bad thing, but as I tried to allude to, I think we have to search for mechanisms and means to actually kind of give significance and respect to a deep need for people to find and, and, and actually come to, come, come to terms with with profound issues that are not commercial uh, in some regards. And uh, I'm not saying we should tax, tax all these developments to create that type of space, but it's a significant and real need that we have in society, and it's diminishing. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> I'll be very quick, and I'll try not to be too flippant, but with ce <laughs> cemeteries, I'm going to go back to my dear lost friend, Irvine. Well, Irvine would probably find a way of building over a cemetery and protecting and retaining it. So. Um, you know, cemeteries are, t are la take huge areas of land, and there is possibly a way of thinking about how, how whilst respecting those places, to somehow find a way of, of using them more effectively. Um, and I was in Brooklyn recently and saw that that was happening, one of the great cemeteries there. The second thing was that in terms of um, Religion. I mean, I went to the school in the west of Scotland, which almost killed any interest in religion in the west coast of Scotland, being brought up in a Protestant community, which uh, put me off religion for about 50 years, until I remember we, got a, we were bidding for a project in Italy for the headquarters for Max Mara. And I went into a church and prayed, and we won the commission. So I thought, well, this is it. <laughs> I usually take my kids with we, me for site we, visits. And we did win it. And we did win it. Of course we won it. I, I said, you know, I haven't asked you for much. You know, <laughs> please, Lord. I want, you don't know. And, and he, what, he, heard, he, heard, he heard my prayer. Let, so let me ask on behalf so, of the rest of the room, how often is this tactic born fruit? <laughs> well, I've given away my secret, but it happens. It's, 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 and the third thing about, about beauty, and I... I you know, I suppose, and I sort of try to emphasize it a little bit in what I was saying, is that for me, multi-faith, multi-use, multi-functional, multi-faith, non-denominational spaces are the ones that I get most excited about. When you talk about beauty, I think one of our most beautiful projects, funnily enough, is a little school we built in Malawi. We took the DFID budget, Department for International Development, $25,000, £18,000. They were building horrible schools for kids in, in Malawi and Rwanda horrible, airless, dark spaces. And with Arup, our engineering partner, we designed a beautiful school with a split roof, five teaching spaces, two external, two regular teaching spaces, and it was the space in between. And maybe it's going back to what Leslie was saying. The space in between was essentially the gap. We pulled the two buildings apart, and the space in between became a place where 
the parents of the kids who have been taught were taught by looking into the, classy, the class environments that their children were being taught in. Unbelievable brought, even for somebody to let me, tears to my eyes that the parents were being taught. Secondly, it became a space for health workers to, uh, for, for, for community mes medicine, and it became a, multi, a sort of non-denominational pl place for prayer. I don't think it's a particularly beautiful building, but my God, I think in terms of inspiring me, uh, it, was, it was everything that I thought a, 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 um, a, a, a building should be uh, in terms of, to me, it's beautiful, it's very basic in its construction, but it says everything about what I think is important in life. Thank and you. I wasn't serious, actually, what I said about the cemeteries. I thought I'd get a laugh, but I didn't get a laugh. I didn't actually mean that. No, I, I hope you know that, Matthew, for the record. I think you died on your feet. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, no, thank you for that. Um, I want to thank AMA and Hague Security Limited for their generous support for tonight's event. So thank you for, for, for making it happen. It's been a brilliant conversation. I don't know much. Um, my sense is, I mean, I don't know much about faith and architecture, and I suspect there's a lot of people in the room who know a great deal about it, and people like me who don't know much. And I think what's been fantastic is it's been an equally rich conversation for those of us who know a great, uh, not much, and for those of you who know a great deal, and that is down to our fantastic panel. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs>